kind of when we started the intro that we're going to start with chapter 16. We're going to go into the endocrine system. And overall, I kind of introed and told you the endocrine system is kind of the system that helps your nervous system ultimately control everything in your body. I'm going to talk about each of the endocrine organs or glands and what hormones that gland makes. Okay, so as you're studying, kind of compartmentalize it. Okay, first I'm going to talk, study the pituitary gland. And here's my list of all the hormones that come from that gland, and this is what those hormones do. Okay? A lot of people will tell you that the endocrine system is hard because you've got a lot of hormones interacting with each other. So it can get confusing. That's why you, as you study it, you need to learn it kind of one part at a time and keep it straight in your mind. And as we go along, I will try to give you kind of silly ways to, you know, remember things the way that I would remember them. Okay? So here's our very confused person. And I say confused because it has boy and girl parts. But this is the only way we can show you a picture of most of the endocrine glands. Okay? They are different in men and women. The glands that men and women have alike are all of the organs other than the reproductive organs. Okay, so starting at the top and going down to give you kind of an overview, you have three different organs and or portions of your brain that have endocrine function. Okay? One of them is the hypothalamus, and that's located right here in this picture. Do you guys remember what the hypothalamus does? kind of controls everything. That's the way I teach it in AMP1. It controls things like your body temperature, helps control your blood pressure. It, it does a lot of stuff in your body. In addition to all of the control we talked about in AMP1, the hypothalamus also makes hormones. It makes a lot of hormones. It makes a category of hormones that are called releasing hormones. We're going to talk about these in just a second. They control, hypothalamus makes oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone. So we're going to talk about all of those. One of the more complex endocrine glands, and it's not really even an endocrine gland, it's a piece of nervous tissue. It just has that endocrine function. Hanging off of the hypothalamus is this little sac-like structure that's called the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is the master endocrine organ in your body. It makes six different hormones. And we're going to learn what each one of those does. The pituitary gland is separated into a front and a back portion that do not really interact with each other that much. It's almost like two different glands combined into one. In the back, okay, and just to give you guys a little tip, anytime you're identifying the hypothalamus and the pituitary, people will say, oh, it's hard to tell. They're so close together. They are. The hypothalamus is always above the pituitary. So the pituitary hangs from the hypothalamus. If you're ever looking at a picture, hypothalamus will be on top, pituitary will be on bottom. Make sense? Okay. And then if we look in the back of the brain back here, this is called the pineal gland. Now we talked about the pineal gland, I know in my AMP1 classes, it's also called the epithalamus. So you may remember what the pineal gland does? It regulates sleep. It produces a hormone that tells you when you're sleepy. Okay? Uh, to give you a little orientation, kind of bring you back to what we did in AMP1, do you remember when you did your brain dissections? And I know my students, I told them, grab the cerebrum and the cerebellum, and you kind of pull it back, and then you saw what looked like butt cheeks and the tongue sticking out at you. Y'all remember that? The pineal gland was that little tongue sticking out at you, way deep inside of the brain. Okay? All right. So now if we go a little further down, here located in the neck is the thyroid. The thyroid gland's major function deals with but their thyroid is either going to be super skinny or overweight in certain regions. And, we're, and it, we'll talk about which way that matters. Okay? On the back of the thyroid gland, there are four teeny tiny little glands called the parathyroids. Parathyroids have to do with calcium regulation in the body. Okay? Now, we're going to talk about all this in detail, I promise. In the chest or the mediastinum is a gland called the thymus. Now, all of us in this room, our thymus is old and shriveled up because we're all adults. But babies have a really big thymus. Okay? 
Going a little further down, these large structures you see here, those are the kidneys. They don't really have much of an endocrine function. The endocrine gland is called the adrenal gland, and they sit right on top of the kidneys. Your adrenal glands have a lot to do with producing adrenaline, which most of us recognize the word adrenaline, right? It kind of peps us up when we're scared or, you know, excited, something like that. Okay. Other than that, our adrenal glands do produce some steroid hormones, and we'll just have to get into those to really understand what they do. Pancreas is a digestive organ, but it also has to do with, it produces hormones insulin and glucagon, which regulates sugar in our body. Okay. And then down at the bottom, these two, I'm sure you guys could probably tell me the hormones they make. The ovary is found in females. What hormones does the ovary make? Estrogen and progesterone, right? Okay. Down here, this is the, where the testis would be located. What does a testicle produce? Testosterone. Okay, so that's your main hormones there. Okay, all right, so that's just kind of our little preview. Now let's cut ways that we categorize our hormones, and then we're going to get into it and really talk about the different hormones. Okay, now I don't make you memorize ways of categorizing hormones just to give you something else to learn. I do it because if you think about it, it helps you kind of understand how they Two basic categories of hormones based off of what they look like would be steroid-based hormones and amino acid-based hormones. Okay, so here's what matters about that. An amino acid-based hormone, amino acids hooked together to make what? I don't know. Proteins. Okay. Amino acids, proteins, something I hope you guys know from your biology class, they are polar molecules, meaning they are water soluble. Okay? So why does that matter? We talked a little bit yesterday. We said that all these hormones are made in one place in your body and then they travel through the blood, right, to get to a target cell where they're going to have an effect. Okay? Well once a hormone gets to a cell, it has to be able to get into that cell to do something to the cell, right? Every cell in your body has a plasma membrane around it. Everybody agrees with me? What's the plasma membrane made of? Phospholipids. What's a lipid? Fat, right? Is a fat water soluble? No, right? Fats don't dissolve in water. Okay? So if I had an amino acid based hormone that does like water, put a charge on it, can that big charged molecule go through that fatty membrane? Of course, no, they can't dissolve in each other, right? So if I have an amino acid based hormone, then it cannot go into that cell when it gets there. It just physically can't go through the membrane. What has to happen is there will be some sort of little receptor on the membrane. The amino acid just binds to the receptor and then the receptor will make something happen inside of the cell and then that makes something else happen. And it's a big long process. They talk about it in your textbook if, if you want to read all the steps of the process. Okay, but here's why it matters. Do you think that would be a very fast action? Is that just going to be immediate? Of course not, right? It's going to take some time. When that amino acid hormone finally makes it to its target cell, it has to bind the cell and then make changes happen inside the cell. So it just takes a little longer once it gets there. Okay? The steroid-based hormones are all synthesized from cholesterol. They are fat-soluble. They're nonpolar. Okay? So it's going to be the exact opposite, right? If that steroid hormone gets to its target cell, whenever the steroid comes in contact with the membrane, straight into the cell, and immediately start doing something to that cell. Okay? So do you kind of see how the steroid ones are going to be faster acting, right? They can just jump right in those cells and do something. Okay? Now here's the downside to that. That seems really good, right? Why, why aren't all of our hormones steroid based make them work faster? The downside is sometimes when they get into our cell and start working, it's harder to get the effect to stop. And we do eventually want these effects to stop. Okay? So don't try to write this down because we're going to talk about this hormone in a minute. But just to give you an example of that, have any of you ever heard of the hormone cortisol? 
seen the commercials for belly fat? Right? It's a new big thing right now. Cortisol is a steroid hormone. The reason it can make people store weight is because people get stressed out and they release tons of that cortisol into cells in your body, goes into your cell and stays there and starts accumulating. And that's why it acts, because it's a steroid hormone. Once you make a bunch of it, it's harder to get it out of your system, and so people start So there is a downside to that, being able to work faster and go into the cell. Okay? Does that make sense? Because okay. when I put the title of the slide, it's chemistry. I knew some people were going to roll their eyes when they saw it, but not really chemistry. We're just talking about the differences. Okay. Another big theme we're going to see as we talk about each of these different hormones is how we control the hormone. So we can categorize the hormone by their control. There's three types. We have humoral stimulus or humoral control, however you want to say it, neural stimulus, and hormonal. It sounds bad, but it's not. Does anybody know what the word humor is supposed to mean in a science class? Humoral has to do with blood, has to do with liquids in your body. So this is, if you want to change the word where it sounds better, this is a blood stimulus. Just to give you an example, we're going to talk about this hormone in detail a little later. If your blood level of calcium gets too low, if it changes, it's, it's a, a way that it's not supposed to be too low or too high, you have endocrine glands in your body that can sense how much, and one of those would be your parathyroid glands. They look at how much calcium is in your blood, and they use that to determine whether they should secrete their parathyroid hormone or not. Okay? So did the brain have to tell it anything? No. There's no other hormone telling it to do anything. That gland is strict blood levels of something are. That's humoral control, which is what's in the blood. Neural control means that at some point the brain is going to be involved and the brain is going to tell the gland when to make the hormone. Okay? So just to give you an example, this is showing you the adrenal gland. And in this example, something has happened that has activated the sympathetic nervous system. Something could be um, you were scared. Okay? You got scared, so all of a sudden your fight or flight mechanism needs to kick in, right? You need to run, something like that. Your brain will send the signal to your adrenal gland, tell your adrenal gland, all right, it's time to make some adrenaline, make some epinephrine, make some norepinephrine. Okay? So the actual stimulus for the gland making the hormone is the brain told it to. Okay? Most people would think that neural stimulus is most common. It's not. That's actually one of the most rare. We don't want the brain to have to tell it what to do because then the nervous system could have just done it. Oh, it didn't need another system. The most common type of control we're going to see as we go through all of these hormones is hormonal stimulus, which seems kind of crazy. How can one hormone tell another hormone what to do? Well, we're going to see this a lot. We see kind of a chain reaction with our hormones. And the way it will work, endocrine gland number one secretes the first hormone. That hormone will travel to the second endocrine gland, tell it to go. Then endocrine gland number two makes another hormone. And then that one will travel to the third endocrine gland. Tell the third endocrine gland, make the final hormone. Okay? So why would we want all those steps? Why not just have one thing go tell that final gland to go? If we have three steps along that path to regulate it. We've got three different chances we can regulate all of that. So we use that kind of stepwise process so we can go back and intervene anywhere along the way. So we're going to see this a lot. Okay? All right, so that's, that's enough intro, right? Let's talk about some hormones. We are going to start with the master endocrine gland. I figure let's just hit the worst one first, get it out of the way, and then we'll talk about the easier ones as we get going, okay? Now, our first gland is the pituitary gland. And the, one, the first thing that makes it hard is they gave it another name. Okay, y'all know that I do this in science class, right? We've got to have five names for everything. The other name for the pituitary gland is the hypothesis. I know. It's a horrible word in and of itself. Okay? The hypothesis, 
the pituitary gland has two parts, a front part and a back part. What's the proper A and P term for meaning towards the front of the body? Anterior. If anybody said ventral, that's kind of right too. But anterior is the more proper term. So you have part of your pituitary called the anterior pituitary. So what's the back side going to be? The posterior pituitary. But we've got to have another name for it, right? The other name for the anterior pituitary is the adenohypophysis. The other name for the posterior pituitary is the neurohypophysis. So this is actually the way you're going to see these words written most of the time. A lot of times I'll say anterior and posterior pituitary because it's just easier to say. But they are properly called the adenohypophysis and the neurohypophysis. What does neuro make you think of? Nervous, right? Brain. It, the back side of the pituitary is called the neurohypophysis because it is actually just an extension of the neural tissue. Okay? It's not really endocrine tissue. It's actually just a piece of the hypothalamus scooching down. I'm going to flip to this picture to kind of show you what that looks like. Okay? So at the top, here's the hypothalamus. Okay? And then this would be the infant the pituitary hangs from. And then this thing that kind of looks like a butt cheek, that is the actual pituitary gland. Okay? The back part is smaller. This back part, just this, is the neurohypophysis, the posterior pituitary. Okay? The way this works, we have our hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is actually going to make the hormones. It's going to make the oxytocin and the antidiuretic hormone. Once those hormones are made in the hypothalamus, they travel down the tract, the hypothalamus. Do you mind remember what the word tract means? a collection of axons in the central nervous system. Okay, so this is still just nervous tissue, right? Hypothalamus, the hormones travel down this piece of nervous tissue and we store the hormones, oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone, in the neurohypophysis. Think more of the back of this as a storage site for our two hormones, our oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone. The brain makes them, squirts it down into the back of the pituitary, and we just let it sit there until we're ready for it. Okay? The adenohypophysis, the front part, is different. Okay? If I flip to that picture where we can focus more on the front, you see how it's not, you don't have this perfect connection of axons, of the neurons actually coming through here. This part of the anterior pituitary is a completely separate piece. This is endocrine tissue. This part of the pituitary actually makes these six hormones that we're going to talk about each one of these hormones inside of the pituitary. So that's a very important distinction between the two sides of the pituitary. Okay. While I have this picture up, I also want to point this out to you because it's this kind of drives you guys crazy. The hypothalamus makes some hormones that interact with the anterior pituitary. Okay? We're going to see a group of hormones coming from the hypothalamus that are called releasing hormones. And then we're also going to see some hormones called inhibiting. How this is going to work, the hypothalamus will make a releasing hormone that hormone will come down here and tell the anterior pituitary, release your hormone. So that's kind of that hormonal control we were talking about just a few minutes ago. The hypothalamus makes the releasing hormone and tells the anterior pituitary, you need to do something. What do you think the inhibiting hormone is going to do if the hypothalamus makes an inhibiting hormone? It will tell the anterior pituitary, don't make the hormone. That makes sense? And we're going to go through each of these one at a time, but I want you to kind of see the big picture. That hypothalamus is kind of what's giving the anterior pituitary permission to make hormones. Okay? And they're going to be named based off of the hormone they control. So to give you an example, one of the hormones made by the adenohypothesis is GH. That's growth hormone. The hypothalamus makes 
GHRH. That's growth hormone releasing hormone. Okay? So if the hypothalamus makes growth hormone releasing hormone, that one will tell the anterior pituitary release growth hormone. Okay? Up here we also have growth hormone inhibiting hormone. So if the hypothalamus makes growth hormone inhibiting hormone, that one will come down here and tell the anterior pituitary, do not make growth hormone. Do you, you guys kind of understand that, the, the trend? We're going to go through each one as we go through the hormones, though. Okay? just want you to kind of see it all together. All right? So let's look at some hormones. I'm going to start with the posterior pituitary hormones, cause, just because there's less of them. So we'll start there, and then we'll get the big six here in a second. We have two hormones that are made in the hypothalamus and stored in our posterior pituitary. They are oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone. Okay. You guys must just be a quiet class because no one's asked me yet. Do I really need to know the words antidiuretic hormone or can I just memorize ADH? You can start with the letters, but you need to actually know what the letters stand for. Okay? So I know somebody was thinking it. If nobody was going to ask it, somebody was thinking it. You do need to know what the letters stand for. Okay? Well, it really wouldn't matter to me if I do give you a short answer question and you need to write the word antidiuretic hormone, it's going to be in the test. So if you're worried about spelling it, it's probably going to be spelled out somewhere in the test. So yeah, that's never a problem. And I wouldn't care if you spelled it wrong as long as I knew what you were talking about. Okay, it's another word. I don't really care. Okay? All right, so that's a good question. All right, so let's talk about these hormones. I bet you guys can predict some of what they do. And I like to approach it that way because that helps you learn it. I hate memorizing. When you memorize, you forget. Okay? So does anybody have any idea what oxytocin does? What is it involved in? It helps, helps you have a baby. Okay? So whenever, what it does is actually help you push the baby out. Oxytocin is a stimulant of smooth muscle contraction. Okay? So you don't want your smooth muscle of your uterus contracting the whole time you're pregnant. That would be bad. The baby would come out before it was time for the baby to come out. Okay? So your hypothalamus doesn't always make large quantities of oxytocin. It makes small quantities towards the end of your labor, uh, end of your labor, towards the end of your pregnancy, the placenta, which is what the baby's attached to, starts making some special secretions, some hormones itself. That tells the brain it's about time for the baby to come. So the brain starts making large amounts of oxytocin and storing it in the posterior pituitary. Then when it's time for labor to happen, the posterior pituitary starts secreting oxytocin into the blood. It moves, it starts making the uterus what contractions are. When a woman says she's having contractions, that is the oxytocin making her uterus, the muscles, physically contract. As labor progresses, more and more oxytocin is released, and the contractions become harder. And that's why the labor contractions start hurting more, trying to really push the baby out. Okay? Now, is that the only time we ever make oxytocin? No. Okay? After the baby is born, oxytocin is still released in fairly high quantities for two reasons. One is it has to keep contracting the uterus because the uterus went from this to this, right? So it's got to keep contracting to get it back down to normal size, okay? But anybody that's ever had a baby in this room and has breastfed can tell me and agree with me that any time a baby latches on to nurse, you get cramps in your stomach, okay? That's because oxytocin is secreted when the baby latches onto the breast. The suckling of a baby makes more oxytocin come out. Oxytocin makes the muscle around the mammary tissue contract so that milk letdown will occur. Okay, so if you've never breastfed, that doesn't make sense to you. Okay? The breast milk is produced up inside of the top of the breast. Okay? Baby can't get it from there. So the oxytocin squeezes the muscle around and makes the milk move further down into the breast so that the baby can get the milk out. And if you've never breastfed or you've never seen that, 
you can physically tell when your milk lets down. You can tell the baby's not getting anything, and then you can feel the difference when the milk moves, and that's the oxytocin making the milk move. Okay, so that's what the word let down means. It has nothing to do with making the milk or anything like that. It just moves the milk. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's, that's actually what I was going to say next. A lot of people have, have heard of Pitocin. If you have to have help going through your labor, they give you a drug called Pitocin. It is synthetic oxytocin. They're just telling your uterus to contract. When you have a scheduled labor, they bring you in early in the morning and start slowly giving you the Pitocin. Usually, they can stop because usually once you start the Pitocin, the woman's body will start making the oxytocin like she needs. If not, you have to keep getting the Pitocin, and then you have a long, horrible, drawn-out labor. Okay? So uh, what we just talked about, explain this to me. Why does breastfeeding make you, your stomach go down faster? It does. Explain that to me then. Because it makes your uterus contract. Every time that baby latches on, your uterus contracts. I'm not saying you thought that you've collected on the outside. We'll go away. Trust me, I have a two-year-old, and those rolls are still hanging out. All right. I'm talking about the physical inside of your stomach goes down. That's why your stomach will contract. Now, it's, I can remember being painful, though, and no one warned me about that. I, I can remember the first time I tried to nurse my daughter, my stomach just cramping up, and I thought, oh, my, there's something else in there that's trying to come out. It's bad. It was a real serious contraction. So just those of you that have never experienced that, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. It's supposed to hurt in your stomach, but that's a good thing. Okay? There's also going to be some mean nurse that comes in there in a few minutes and pokes on you real hard. She's feeling of your uterus, making sure it is shrinking down like it's supposed to. Or a lot of you will be that mean nurse one day, poking on somebody's belly. Um, okay, let me tell you one other story, and then I promise I'll get back to this. My delivery nurse was one of my ex-students. Okay? So I'm not going to have any more children, so y'all won't ever be looking at me in that position. But know that you may see one of you, those of you going to be nurses, if you decide to do um, deliver, labor and delivery, you may see some of your teachers one day. So be nice to them. Okay, my, stu my student was very good. She was good to me. All right, now, everything we've talked about with oxytocin is pregnancy and babies, right? Do you think men make oxytocin? We got a man in the room. We got to talk about men, too. Do you think men make oxytocin? They do, right? So why? That means there's got to be something else this hormone does, right? We don't understand it 100%. But we do know that during sexual intercourse, men and women both make small amounts of oxytocin. We don't know if it is exactly what it does. They think it's more linked to orgasm and things like that. But they just know that since men make it, there's, there's got to be something else it does, or men wouldn't bother making the hormone. Okay? But men do make it as well. They just don't store it in large quantities like women do. All right, moving on. Next hormone in the neurohypothesis is called antidiuretic. Let me ask you this. What does a diuretic do? Makes you pee a lot, right? If you take a diuretic, you are going to pee constantly. So if your body makes something called antidiuretic, what's it going to make you do? I want to have a hormone in my body that makes me not pee. Okay, dehydration. If I, for some reason in my body, need to keep water, I don't want to constantly pee, right? Okay, let me give you some examples of why that could be. Dehydration. You have low levels of water in your body. Okay? Something we'll learn as we get further into AMP from your blood. So it's pulling water out of your blood to make pee. If your blood pressure gets low, you don't want to take water out of your blood, right? So your body starts secreting that antidiuretic hormone so you'll keep the water. Okay? That's all it does. If you don't need to lose water, your body makes antidiuretic hormone, and you start keeping water. You pee less. Okay? Coffee or liquor, beer, what do you do? You pee a lot, right? No matter what. It does not matter if you get dehydrated. It does not matter if your blood pressure gets low. You're going to keep on peeing. The reason you can keep peeing is because caffeine and alcohol are both inhibitors of antidiuretic hormone. 
When you drink alcohol, you block your brain from being able to make ADH. When you drink caffeine, you block your brain from making ADH. That's why you have to pee so much. Okay? It's not really going to hurt you short term. It would just hurt you long term if you continued to do it. Mm -hmm. No. It has nothing to do with trying to force alcohol out because the alcohol is being processed by your liver, not your kidneys. So the only reason you're peeing is your brain cannot make antidiuretic hormone. So you just keep, your kidneys just keep on working. There's nothing telling your kidneys stop taking the water out. What's a hangover? What causes a hangover? Dehydration. You're dehydrated because you have peed all of the water out of your body that you need. The way to cure a hangover, drink water before you go to sleep that night, right? You got to know that? How'd y'all make it so far in life without knowing that? <laughs> Don't drink too much, though. If you drink too much, you make yourself sick and it's all wrong. I was 18 once, I remember. All right. So those two hormones make sense? Okay. Now let's look at the six hormones that come from the anterior pituitary. I'm going to start with the first one. I think it's the easiest. It's called growth hormone. What does growth hormone make you do? Grow. So what organs in your body do you think are the main organs that growth hormone has an effect on? Bone, right? What else has to grow if my bone grows? My muscle. That's your two main ones. That's not the only ones. If you have growth hormone being made, every organ in your body can grow. Okay? A lot of times people that abuse growth hormone-based steroids they don't die because their muscles get too big. They die because their heart grows too big or their liver. That's real common too. So too much growth hormone can be a bad thing. Most of us in this room, we're not making a whole lot of growth hormone, right? Why? We're grown, right? You make more growth hormone before puberty and then during puberty. After you leave the point of puberty, then growth hormone kind of tapers off. Okay? So what tells the growth hormone to be made? Complicated scenario that we're not going to learn a lot about. But you could kind of predict some of it. If you make a lot of growth hormone during puberty, what else are you making during puberty? Sex hormones, right? Testosterone, estrogen. So a lot of it is linked to the other hormones in your body that you're making telling it it's time for you to grow. Okay? There's lots of disorders with growth hormone. People grow too much, not enough. You know, it, it can get really complicated talking about growth hormone. But growth is not the only thing that growth hormone controls. Growth hormone also has an effect on your metabolism. So how can we remember that? Okay, do you remember, I, I really remember it vividly and, and think about it all the time. I can remember being 8, 10 years old and I could sit down and eat six Snicker bars. And then what happened? Nothing. I never gained a pound, right? The next day, you know, they worried about me. Can I do that now? Nope. We look at a Snicker bar and we gain a pound, right? So the difference is how we metabolize our food. When we're a little kid and we're making a lot of growth hormone, the growth hormone makes us focus more on fat metabolism. That's why you can eat all that crap when you're a kid and not gain weight because your growth hormone is telling your body break down fat. And as you get older, Less growth hormone, less fat metabolism, you start doing sugar metabolism. So if you eat fat, you store it. All right? So that's, that's the other thing that growth hormone does. And this is a, a little flow chart out of your book. Uh, it, it, I don't want you to like, try to memorize all the effects because it, it gets complicated. Like I said, we're not worried about it. Is when you make growth hormone, it does affect that fat and carbohydrate metabolism. It's going to increase your metabolism, mainly increasing that fat metabolism. Okay, so that's, that's what this has to do with it. Now, the main thing I want you to keep up with as far as control of growth hormone, one of those releasing hormones and those inhibiting hormones, which is what we were talking about a little bit earlier. Okay, so if I draw, and I don't make fun of my butt, but if I draw well, our pituitary gland over here, the way this will work is if you need to make growth hormone, the hypothalamus makes growth hormone releasing hormone. All right? That will travel down into the anterior pituitary. 
tell the anterior pituitary, okay, you need to make growth hormone, right? Then the growth hormone leaves the pituitary, goes into the blood, travels through the body, affects your metabolism, goes to your skeleton, tells your skeleton to grow, goes to your muscle, tells your muscle to grow, okay? So you need to understand you kind of have that pathway, okay? Hypothalamus makes the releasing hormone telling it what to do. Make sense? Yes. Show signs of life. Yes. Okay. All right. That's our growth hormone. Now if we switch and look at our next hormone from the adenohypothesis, it is called the thyroid stimulating hormone. So this one should be super easy. What do you think thyroid stimulating hormone is going to do? Stimulate your thyroid. Your thyroid is also an endocrine gland, right? So this is a hormone that's going to go tell another gland to make a hormone. It is controlled by a hormone from the hypothalamus called thyroid releasing hormone. So you get this cascade effect, right? The hypothalamus makes thyroid releasing hormone. That goes to the anterior pituitary, tells the anterior pituitary stimulating hormone. Then the thyroid stimulating hormone will go to the thyroid gland, tell the thyroid gland, make your, make your hormones, and then we get, finally you're going to get an effect. Okay, so this TSH is kind of just in the middle of this pathway. Okay, we're going to talk about the thyroid gland here in a little while. It's the easy one, right? We're going to play with this cascade in lab today. Okay, we're going to do a computer simulated lab because we don't, we're not really going to play with pituitaries and thyroids. That's messy work. You've got to have live rats to do it. So I don't do that. We're going to simulate it and kind of take parts of the pathway out and put stuff in and see how we have the effect. So we're really going to practice with this idea of the three hormones and how they play with each other, interact with each other. Okay? All right. Next hormone from the anterior pituitary wins the award for worst name of the class. Okay? It is called the adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH. But if we dissect this, it tells us what it does. It is a hormone that once released from the pituitary travels to the adrenal gland and tells the adrenal gland to make hormones like cortisol. So that's where this horrible, crazy name comes from. It's telling you what it does. Adrenocorticotropic hormone stimulates the adrenal gland. So it's just like we just saw with the thyroid, right? This is a hormone that's going to travel to another gland and tell it what to do. It's controlled by a releasing hormone. Okay, so you guys don't have to draw these things if you don't want, but I just like to see it visually. I think it makes sense. So from the hypothalamus, we will get a hormone called CRH, corticotropic releasing hormone. It's going to leave the hypothalamus, go down into the anterior pituitary, tell the anterior pituitary to release adrenocorticotropic hormone. Then that adrenocorticotropic hormone goes into the blood and travels to the adrenal gland and tells the adrenal gland to make a hormone. Okay? So hopefully you guys are kind of getting bored with seeing this same scenario, this pathway. If you're getting bored, that's good sense to you. That the hypothalamus tells it what to do, then the pituitary releases it, and then it goes where it needs to go to have an effect. Okay? We're making it. We're halfway through the pituitary. Okay? The next two hormones from the anterior pituitary we group together because they're always secreted together and they travel to the same place in the body to have an effect. We call both of these hormones the gonadotropins. So what endocrine organ do you think they're going to go to to have an effect? What are your gonads? Reproductive organs, ovaries and testes. Both of your gonadotropins are going to go into the blood and travel to your reproductive system. Okay? The first pituitary is called FSH. 
follicle stimulating hormone. Its job is to stimulate your reproductive follicles, your reproductive egg and sperm. So if you're a man, you continually, constantly, all day, every day, your brain is making a releasing hormone, telling your anterior pituitary, make FSH. FSH is always traveling to the testicle and always making you make sperm. Men do it continually. If you're a woman, then your release of follicle stimulating hormone happens once a month. Okay? Women don't make any. Then about midway through their uterine and menstrual cycle, a woman secretes a high amount of follicle stimulating hormone. That makes the woman produce an egg. And then the follicle stimulating hormone drops back off. Okay? That's what triggers what we call ovulation, follicle stimulating hormone. Mm -hmm. Correct. Well, and no, you never, you don't make an egg at all if you're on a birth control pill. The reason you don't have a period is because you're taking, and we're going to talk a lot about birth control in the reproductive system, but if you're on a birth control, you have just a cycle up, down, all your hormones cycle. If you're on birth control pill, your hormones are up here, and they stay steady. So you just never make an egg. Well, I say that. They, if your birth control is 99.9% .9 effective, basically every 100 cycles you have a chance of making an egg. You eventually will. Yes, then that's why you don't make eggs. Because when you're pregnant, you don't get those surges of hormones and that's why you don't make eggs. That's why you can't get pregnant while you're pregnant. You don't make eggs. That only happens on soap operas. All right, <laughs> but we're, I probably, we're going to go over a lot to detail about that later because I know a lot of people, even if you don't want to know if you take birth control, I think you kind of need to know what you're popping in your mouth. I don't think you should just take it on face value because your doctor says to. All right, so follicle stimulating hormone makes egg and sperm. The other one called luteinizing hormone, it works with follicle stimulating hormone. We're going to do a lot of these details later. But the main thing you need to keep up with now is that luteinizing hormone triggers the release of your other hormones that come from your gonads, which you guys spouted out to me at the beginning of class. So luteinizing hormone is going to make the testicle produce what hormone? Testosterone. It's going to make the ovary masterone. Okay, and we're going to talk about details of that a little later. Okay, so for those of you that like my little drawing on each slide, I'm a very visual person myself. Okay. So this is controlled by a releasing hormone. The hypothalamus is going to make something called GnRH. That stands for gonadotropin releasing hormone. That travels down into the anterior pituitary, makes the anterior pituitary produce FSH and LH. Just think of them, think of them as a pair. They're, they're made together. Okay? And then these two leave the pituitary, go into the blood, and travel to the ovary and testis. Okay. Well, both of them, I guess. Doesn't say, oh, I'm going left this time. You know, it always goes to both. Okay? We good? We got one more pituitary hormone, and it's an easy one. Okay? About time we had something easy, right? Our easy pituitary hormone is called prolactin. Prolactin does one thing. Prolactin triggers milk production. Okay? So we can all guess whether we've had a child or not. What's well, the only time in the body you only time in your life the body needs to produce high levels of prolactin? When you're breastfeeding, right after labor. Okay? What makes the body keep producing prolactin is the stimulus of the baby suckling. Okay? If, as long as that baby suckles, then a woman can indefinitely make breast milk because they will continue to make prolactin. There are synthetic forms of prolactin now. You can adopt a child, take a pill, and nurse your child. Okay? Um, 
I nursed my child because I'm a microbiologist and I know the scientific reasons of why it's good. But I will tell you from experience, and I'm not putting down anybody that disagrees with me, I don't think it's beautiful. I, I don't think it's a bonding experience. I wanted, I mean, it's, it hurts. It's not fun, okay? Some women have a completely different experience. But to me, it's more of a, the body is designed to do it, so you need to do it until about the three-month point. It's not bad for them after it, but there's no true benefit beyond nutrition after the, the three-month-old point, okay? If you want to breastfeed your child till they're 15, to each their own, okay? But it's not anything that you, you need to do, okay? But back in, you know, the early 1900s, we had people called wet nurses, other people's children, okay? So there's nothing special between a mother and a child. It is simply the suckling after a child is made that makes the body produce prolactin, okay? This is controlled, same way, we draw our butt cheek on here. Okay, from the hypothalamus, we have a hormone called prolactin-releasing hormone. There's also a prolactin-inhibiting hormone. It can go both ways. But it travels down into the anterior pituitary, tells the anterior pituitary make prolactin. Prolactin enters the bloodstream, travels to the breast, triggers milk production. Okay. Now, again, we got this question. Do men have breasts? Yes, is it no? Yes, men have breasts. They have big breasts. So can men make prolactin? They can. Men do make prolactin. This is understood even less than why men make oxytocin. But they do. They have shown, and I really tried hard to look this up because I wanted to look smart, but it didn't work. I found a lot of experiments people ran on mice where they gave male mice high dosages of prolactin, and they exhibited increased sexual activity, okay? They think that it's related possibly to impotency. Men who are impotent, meaning they can't get an erection, and things like that, those men have shown, they've tested blood samples, and those men don't make prolactin. So we don't know the details, but we think that that's probably what the prolactin is related to in men. Women make prolactin times, during times other than right after they've had a child, too. Swelling occur right before a menstrual cycle, and that's because during, at that point in the menstrual cycle, women produce a small surge of prolactin. It's not enough to make milk come out of the breast, but it does make the mammary glands swell like they're preparing to produce milk, and then they'll go back down when the prolactin goes away. Okay? See? A lot of you had kids, and you learned something today, right? Okay. So let's do, let's do one more gland together because we need to really understand this one so we can do our lab today. Okay? So thank God, right, we're done with the pituitary gland. We've been talking about that one gland for an hour. Okay? But that, like I said, that's the hardest one. That is the master endocrine gland in your body. So that's the one that's going to take you the longest to sit down and study and make sure you understand. Okay? So now we're ready to talk about the thyroid gland. Again, the thyroid gland is located in the neck. So what you're seeing in this picture right here, this is the larynx. You can feel that in your neck. That's where you have the hard pieces of cartilage. It's called the thyroid cartilage. Why is it called the thyroid cartilage? It's in front of the thyroid. Okay? Your Adam's apple, if you can find it, yes, women have them too, your Adam's apple, behind that, that's where your thyroid would be. Okay? The thyroid's kind of bilobed. Okay, so you kind of have one look, big chunk on one side, big chunk on another side, okay? Little connecting area in the middle. Now, that's all the anatomy of this we're going to talk about. Just want you to kind of have an idea of what it looks like and where it is. There are two glands, okay? The first one is the most important hormone that the thyroid gland makes. It's called the thyroid hormone. So finally, something named normal, right? Okay, so remember... This is the one where we have the hypothalamus makes the TRH. TRH from the hypothalamus tells the anterior pituitary make TSH, right? The TSH travels down here, and that's what tells us to make 
the thyroid hormones. So we're still kind of talking about that same cascade that we're just finishing it. This is the end of it. Okay. Thyroid hormone is kind of a generic name. The, the thyroid actually makes two different things called T4 and T3. The proper names, um, I'm not even going to say it because I can't ever pronounce T3 correctly. Ultimately, that T3 becomes T4. So again, you don't need to know all those processes. That's pointless to memorize that. Okay? So you're just going to collectively know of it as the thyroid hormone. Okay? Thyroid hormone is a, important for you to know is that the thyroid hormone has a high amount of iodine in it. Okay? So people with thyroid disorders, a lot of times they have issues with metabolizing iodine. Okay? We don't have as many, iodine, as many thyroid disorders now as we used to because we add iodine to something that everybody uses every day. Do you guys know what that is? Salt. If you've ever noticed, read on the box of salt you have at home. It says iodized salt. We add iodine to it to keep our thyroids healthy. Okay, so that's just a little piece of knowledge, general knowledge for you. Okay, all right. So what does thyroid hormone do? This is the hardest one for me to possibly explain to you. This is kind of one of those that fits into the. It kind of has an effect on everything in your body category. Okay, so I'll tell you. I'm going to write it all down on a slide, and make you print it out again. It's in your book. There's a table in your book, table 16.2. And it shows regulates growth, development, your cardiovascular, your muscular, your skeletal, your gastrointestinal, reproductive, and even your skin. Okay? So, oh, oh my God, I would never expect you to memorize every little thing it could do. Okay? But it does have an effect on every system. It is known as your body's major met metabolic hormone. Okay? So what you're going to see is... If you, yes, this isn't micro yet. Yeah, okay, it is what you're doing. I'm going to let you sit down. <laughs> All right, so what you're going to see is if somebody makes a lot of thyroid hormone, they're going to have faster metabolism. Okay, so somebody that is hyperthyroid, what are they going to look like? They're going to be super skinny. And I, it is. Stupid thing, sorry. It is disgusting when you hear somebody tell you, God, it's so horrible. I can eat anything and I just can't gain weight. I mean, I agree. You just kind of want to look at them and give them a really mean face. But it is a disorder and it is not fun for that person because being too skinny does have a lot of negative effects on your overall health, okay? But what we see a lot more than the hyperthyroid condition is hypothyroidism. Hypothyroid is an underactive thyroid. Those people don't make enough thyroid hormone. And they are going to be overweight. That's a much more complex issue. But let me finish this, and then I'll explain that. Okay, all right. Most people that are hypothyroid, when I say overweight, that doesn't mean they're going to just be big. Okay, where are they going to be big? Their midsection is the most common. Second most common place is their neck and their chest right here. And why is that? Where's the thyroid at? Right here. So most of your people that are hyperthyroid are going to store. Okay. Now there are those weird people that are skinny and they have hypothyroid. You are just actually one of the lucky people. All right. And you think, no, I'm not. I have a thyroid condition. The way this works, and I don't even know if I can completely explain it to you. I'm, I don't know that I'm smart enough. But what is happening when you're hypothyroid, you're not making the thyroid hormone. But for some reason, your other hormones are taking over your metabolism and keeping it normal. But you, the reason you have issues is because of all of the other things that that thyroid hormone is supposed to control. So there has to be some reason you know, and I don't want you to tell a class, but I'm asking you to. There has to be some reason you know that you are hypothyroid. See what I'm saying? 
There has to be something else going on in your body, and that's where your thyroid hormone is not making, you're not making enough thyroid hormone for it to control that. Does that make sense to you? Like my mom is hypothyroid, and the way she knew, she never eats anything, and her legs look like the legs of a 15-year-old. Skinny, nice, perfect legs, exercise all the time, but her abdomen and her neck is big. So that's what triggered her to go to the doctor and say, something's not right. So my point is, there has to be something that made you realize He felt it and told you you were hypothyroid? Do you take medicine for it? I don't know then. I have to think about it. Most people, most people that are hypothyroid are going to be over, overweight. The people that are underweight usually are making enough thyroid hormone that they can keep their metabolism going normal, but something else hormones not going to be able to do the other job. That's, that's not a good explanation, but I'll do better. I'll try to think about it and do better. Okay? All right. Um, okay, that's enough on that. One other hormone made by your thyroid gland is called calcitonin. It does help regulate the calcium levels in your body, but it is not the most important thing that we use to regulate calcium. So we're going to learn it, but it's not, you know, you can put you a little star somewhere and say, okay, this is not the one that does the most. Okay, this is more of the minor hormone that regulates calcium. And I tried to make this slide as clear as possible, but for some reason the, this one is still one that you guys tend to mix up for some reason. So let me remind you of what a couple things are. So in your body, you have bones, right? Let me draw me a phyto bone here. Okay. Your bones are the major storage site for calcium, right? Okay. Once you put the calcium in your bone, is it there forever? No, it's a storage site, so that means it has to have a way to go in and out. Okay? If you take the calcium out of your bone, you put it into your blood, and then your blood can carry it in your body where it needs to be used. Okay? You can go the other way, too. If you've just drank a ton of calcium in your blood, you can put that calcium in your bone and store it for later. Okay? There's two different cells that do osteoclast and osteoblast. Y'all remember those from AMP1, right? What does an osteoblast do? Bone. So the osteoblast is the one that takes it from the blood and puts it in your bone. The osteoclast destroys it, right? That's the way we remember it. So the osteoclast is what takes it out of your bone and puts it in your blood. Okay, so you guys got to kind of remember that for this to make sense. The overall job that calcitonin is trying to do is to decrease the level of calcium in your blood and increase the level of calcium in your bone. That by inhibiting the osteoclast and stimulating the osteoblast. So overall, this hormone is going to be released when you have extra calcium. Okay? which actually does not happen all that often. That's why I say this is not the major hormone that does this. But if for some reason I have decided I'm going to eat an entire bucket of ice cream, okay? well, I'm going to have a lot of calcium going through my digestive system. I'm going to absorb a lot of calcium into my blood. Well, I want to keep that calcium. I don't want to throw it away. I may need it later. So if I have those high levels of calcium in my blood, my thyroid will produce calcitonin. Then I'm going to start taking that calcium out of my blood, putting it into my bone, and storing it for later. Okay? The really neat thing about this hormone is this hormone is how we've made most of our osteoporosis drugs. So we make synthetic forms. We change it a little. But we make synthetic forms of calcitonin. And people that are suffering from osteoporosis they need more calcium in their bone. So we give them fake calcitonin so that every little piece of calcium they eat, they'll stick it in their bone before they do anything else with it. Okay, so that's why I think it's kind of neat. Okay? We're going to do one more because it makes sense to do it right now. Okay? 
the one more we're going to do is the one hormone that's made in the parathyroid gland. The parathyroid gland are those four small little glands on the back of the thyroid. So if you look at this picture we have here on the side, this is that picture I showed you a minute ago turned around. This is the back side. Okay? So you're looking at the two lobes of your thyroid and seeing that those little parathyroids are kind of small stuck in there. That's where they're found. Okay? They only make one hormone called parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone is the antagonist of calcitonin. Okay? So we don't even really have to teach it. It's the exact opposite of what I just said for calcitonin is to increase the level of calcium you have in your blood. So that means you're lacking calcium in your blood. So if I don't have enough calcium in my blood, then my nerve impulse can't happen. My muscle contractions can't happen, right? Calcium is very important. I have to have it in my blood, too. So if I need more calcium in my blood, I'm going to secrete parathyroid hormone. My osteoclasts are going to start working, right? Because they're going to start breaking down the bone, pulling the calcium out of my bone, putting it in my blood so I can use it. Okay? Now here's the way you do this. Since calcitonin and parathyroid hormone are opposite of each other, you learn one, right? And then you remember that the other is the exact opposite. Okay? So if you say, okay, well, I'm going to memorize calcitonin. Calcitonin puts calcium into my bone. So calcitonin activates osteoblast. Then parathyroid is just the exact opposite. Does that make sense? They just do the exact opposites of each other. That's what the word antagonist means. I use that word. I don't know if you knew what that meant. Antagonists are opposites. Okay? All right, guys. We have done the majority of the hormones. We've got a few more we're going to do. Does anybody have any questions? 